Hello um, and welcome to our virtual audience that's joining us today to discuss the BDS resolution at the Middle East Studies Association. Welcome uh, to our esteemed panelists who I'll be introducing in just a moment. I want to uh, share with our audience the context of our gathering today. Um, as the title indicates, there is currently a BDS resolution for consideration uh, to the entire membership of the middle eligible membership of the Middle East Studies Association, meeting those members who have renewed their membership for this year, 2022. The reason that this resolution has come before the membership is a result of some seven years of organizing amongst the members of MESA who have responded to the 2005 Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions of Israel, which seeks to mobilize uh, international solidarity in support of their cause for liberation in the face of um, diplomatic intransigence, as well as the foreclosure of other opportunities for accountability and resolution to the Palestinian condition of unfreedom. Across these seven years, many committed members of the Middle East Studies Association, many of them um, uh, Palestinian scholars and scholars on Palestine um, imbued by this particular training and expertise have organized presidential panels on intersectionality, as Dr. Shireen Say Ali has, uh, did do for us in 2017, organized roundtables on anti-Blackness and transnational solidarity between Black and Palestinian communities, have organized particular speakers to address uh, the entire body in ways that have centered this kind of um, political commitment, have also in 2017 in a deep commitment to the strength of the association itself and its viability, uh, worked to amend the bylaws so that MESA um, can continue to thrive and grow um, in ways that are consonant with the times. Um, and so this, um, this long legacy of, or I guess short-term legacy, relative, um, relatively long legacy of organizing has demonstrated both uh, a, a commitment to the world we live in, as well as a commitment um, to the, you know, the strength of the Middle East Studies Association as an academic association, as well as centering what is the role of the academy and as academics um, in these broader questions. All of that um, came before the business meeting of the Middle East Studies Association in December 2021 when a BDS resolution was considered. 93% of those attending members uh, of the 444 attending members, they voted overwhelmingly to push this to a referendum. Now before the entire MESA membership, that voting um, has been open since January 31 and will close next Tuesday on March 22nd to help contextualize that vote, to help answer a number of outstanding questions, to also advocate very clearly for support of the resolution. We are um, joined today by this esteemed panel, whom I will introduce in order of speaking appearance. Um, first, we have Professor Shirin Say Ali, an associate professor of history, author of Men of Capital, Scarcity and Economy in Mandate Palestine, co-editor of the Journal of Palestine Studies and co-editor of Jadaliya. Professor Charles Hirschkind is professor of anthropology at UC Berkeley and author of the ethical soundscape cassette sermons in Islamic counterpublics, as well as the feelings of history, Islam, Romanticism and Andalusia. Next will be Professor Kamran Rastegar, a professor of comparative literature at Tufts University, where he researches and teaches Arabic and Persian literature and cinemas of Iran and the Arab world. And last but not least is Maya Wind, a PhD candidate in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University. Thank you all uh, for being with us. And now I'll turn uh, to Professor Say Eddie and ask you, Shireen, if I may, you're a leading scholar in the field of Palestinian studies. Can you discuss with us the academic freedom of Palestinian scholars? 
Often when BDS is brought up, the reactionary response is a concern with Israeli academics in a way that obfuscate, if not outright erases, the infringement of the academic freedom of Palestinian scholars, including their access to archives, their ability to conduct field work, and even to speak without punishment. Thanks so much, Nora, and thanks everyone. It's so good to be here with you all virtually. Um, I had thought we were going to do a little personal. How did I get to BDS? Or are we going to do You are that? absolutely correct. Okay. Before I turn to the questions, let's start with each of you. Um, <laughs> specifically center yourselves in this world, not just in Mesa, but in this world, who you are, how you come to Palestine, how you come to BDS. Thank you, Shireen. <laughs> sure. So um, I'm going to start with that and, and return to the question after everybody sort of does their personal, how did I get here? Um, I'm a child of a Palestinian a man and woman who became like 750,000 other Palestinians refugees in 1948. I am a product and a scholar of the ongoing Nakba or catastrophe that spans um, a century now of denial of Palestinian political rights and peoplehood. I came to BDS as one station of many in the Palestinian struggle. Um, it was in 2005 at Israeli Apartheid Week in New York City um, when I moderated a panel that reflected on the call from Palestinians to name Israeli rule apartheid and to struggle against that regime through boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Five years earlier, I was part of a group of friends who were all graduate students at the time, and we established the first Students for Justice in Palestine in 2000. And this is, you know, Kamran was in this world. And this is an important moment that I think is lost to us now. It's a pre-September 11 moment. It's a moment when, you know, organizers are, um, um, you know, in fact, just before September 11, as everyone knows, people were in Dublin organizing around, you know, um, there were multiple organizing <laughs> efforts happening and a real momentum and, 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 and movement around the charges of apartheid. Um, but I think I also wanna point out that, and I think this is something that often gets lost, that, that BDS is really a vehicle. It's not the movement itself. The movement is one um, that for many Palestinians and for many uh, uh, people around the world has really shaped the politics of our everyday, um, as well as who we are and how we exist in the world. And I think in that sense, um, I really want to highlight, like on the personal level, Palestine not as a problem, but as a gift. And I think that gift is, is one that allows us to, um, it really invites and demands us to escape the logics of racialization and civilizational hierarchies um, that measure today Palestinian life as less valuable than Israeli life and are in conjunction with all of the struggles against all forms of racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Blackness, xenophobia. Uh, all of those are central. The struggle against those are the central to the Palestinian um, demand for freedom. And, and I just wanted to put that in that broader historical trajectory that the, that the demand in front of us now as a Middle East Studies Association is to uh, put Palestine in that broader historical struggle um, for social justice. And we make this call uh, building on lessons from various liberation struggles um, and traditions, be they Jewish, Black, Indigenous, and Latinx, that no one is free until we are all free. Thank you, Shireen. Go ahead, Charles, and then Kamran and Maya, if you can also situate yourself uh, personally in similar ways. Thank you, Nora. Um, welcome to everyone here. And um, my internet is a little unstable, but I think it's going to hold. But if I disappear for a moment, um, I'll be right back. So I don't have any personal connection to Palestine through family, ethnicity, history, you know, or DNA that I know of. Um, my concern for people of the Middle East generally, and for Palestinians in particular, is something that grew up over the course of my academic work in the region. As I spent time in different Middle Eastern countries, 
From the time of my graduate work forward, I became more and more aware of the way people's lives and livelihoods remained painfully limited and regularly violated by the region's military and economic subordination to the West. Over the course of my life, it's hard to remember a time when there weren't American bombs falling on somewhere on people's heads in the region. This condition is most striking in relation to Palestine, whose people have faced 70 long years of brutal domination by Israel, backed by the United States. I can think of many moments over the last 35 years that have helped shaped, shaped my judgment um, and feeling for the plight of Palestinians, but I'll just mention one quickly. Some years ago, around 2012, I gave a talk on the Arab Spring in Ramallah, and while there I visited Jerusalem, a place I'd never been. Um, many had told me about what a wonderful city it was, rich in history and culture, but what I found and felt walking through the streets was something very different, something I think George Orwell has described somewhere, well, I can't remember where. One group, confident in their sense of belonging and entitlement, enjoying the mobility and immunity afforded them in this heavily policed city, and then a despised and subordinate underclass, vulnerable to the whims and wantonness of their occupiers, not citizens of their country, but objects of suspicion, security, and disdain by a population out enjoying the fruits of their privilege in this beautiful city. There's a visceral disturbance one feels when confronted with such institutionalized inequality and the ugliness it produces. I would not want to go back there. So my support from BDS is a result of this and many other such experiences of colonialism in the post-colonial Middle East. So I'll stop there. I guess I'm next. Um, so first I just want to sort of express my gratitude for the invitation to speak here and to just say that I'm humbled to be in this, uh, in this group. Um, uh, just Briefly, I mean, it's uh, my relationship to Palestine is is kind of uh, complicated a little bit, um, but I'll just try to uh, point to a few milestones. Um, I'm an Iranian American. I grew up in Iran. My um, my family left Iran as so many Iranians did as uh, sort of uh, political um, expulsees. Um, my father was. Uh, subjected to persecution, you might say, after the revolution, and we were from a kind of leftist, uh, secular uh, background, and uh, my mother was American, is American, and uh, so all of these elements sort of made it difficult for our family to remain, even though we tried to remain, actually, in Iran for a few years after the revolution. And um, when I went to college, I was interested in the Middle East, I suppose, uh, for identity reasons. And um, and my my advisor was uh, Aaron Berman at Hampshire College, who is a liberal Zionist critic of the uh, state of Israel in some ways. I, I don't know if I, I characterize him in a way that he would uh, sort of agree with, but that's my, my take on him. And I took classes with him. And, uh, and I wrote at Hampshire, you have to do these sort of sustained uh, studies, and I did a study of the rise of Palestinian nationalism in the 1930s, um, inspired by by Aaron's uh, teaching, and uh, and he was very sort of uh, uh, he guided me a lot in in that project, even as I think we already had some disagreements on the question of Zionism. Um, later, when I went to grad school, I started, I was studying Arabic a little as an undergrad, and I think my interest in Arabic was was a, a, a kind of rebellion against my Iranian uh, sort of background. Um, I perceived a kind of anti-Arab racism uh, prevalent among Iranians, and I and I thought that it was a way to kind of combat that um, by studying Arabic. And I traveled to Egypt uh, as an undergraduate. When I went to grad school, I wanted to do a study abroad, and I decided to go to Birzeit University in 1999. This is pretty pre precisely Shunin also pointed to that moment of like the the early sort of last last days of Oslo and the early um, Second Intifada period, and how political organizing in New York, where I was and Shireen was, um, you know, sort of was influencing the, the, the graduate students who were working on the Middle East there. <clears throat> My experience in, in Birzeit was, was, I was completely unprepared for it. Um, this is even before the Intifada. So, uh, you know, figuratively, I mean, people would call it a quiet period, but the horrors I observed there, I mean, I lived with a group of Palestinian young men from Gaza as my, my housemates, they were Birzeit students. Um, and they welcomed me into the house. And uh, you know, over the course of the summer, I learned a lot about their lives. And it, I, was, I was really not prepared. 
You know, I, I um, one, once or twice they confronted me about my insensitivity to their experiences. Um, you know, as I traveled around with my U.S. passport and came back home to drink tea and talk to them about things that I'd seen, um, and and just the the kind of lived uh, granular level experience of people at that time. You know, again at a time which is quite quite different than it is now. Um, sort of living lives of uh, of indignity, I think, was probably the most the key thing that I took away, the sense that they had of not being able to live dignified lives was just profound to me and something that that compelled me to sort of to when I came back to, to try to do something uh, uh, significant on, on this. I remember, um, I think the first um, that I the first that I was aware of, of, of a boycott kind of line of thinking was actually um, uh, a friend of Shirin and mine at the time, Oz Shilach, uh, uh, on his website, oznek.com, I don't know if it still exists, um, uh, published a, a, a cultural and artistic boycott of Israel petition, and a number of us signed. Um, and uh, I know it's not as significant as a PAC, PACBI statement that came out a couple of years later, but it did precede it. And um, it just, uh, it, it, to me, it's sort of significant to remember again in that moment that there were, that these were these were new new ways of new ways of of trying to engage the question. Um, and um, since then, I've you know I've I've tried to sustain a line of interest and study on Palestine in my work uh, in a comparative way, in a way that put, that puts Palestine in, in conversation with other contexts. But as my work has developed, I've become much more interested in broader questions of coloniality. Indigeneity, um, settler colonialism, and Palestine is paradigmatic for all of these to me. And um, and so it's it's impossible for me to teach a class without having Palestine be part of it. And it's impossible for me to do research without some reference to Palestine as I engage those topics. Um, so I you know I've signed BDS petitions and I signed a PACBI petition almost immediately, not out of any sort of so, I don't know. It, it just seemed it just seemed not even a, a question to me that I would have to do that, and uh, and so um, you know I stand here, I, I sit here, <laughs> um, you know, um, at this point, uh, uh, full of anticipation for how this movement can develop, and um, I think I'll just stop there. Um, so thank you so much, Noah. It's it's truly an honor to be here with you all. Uh, so I'll share sort of briefly my where I'm, how I'm coming to this work. Uh, so I'm from Jerusalem. Uh, and as an Israeli citizen, uh, honoring the call for BDS is my foundational responsibility, as I understand it. Uh, I came to this work through my experience of organizing uh, both in Israel and Palestine. Um, I began as a young adult uh, organizing against the Israeli military draft, uh, working with feminist initiatives for demilitarization but also organizing uh, with Palestinian activists working for justice and liberation across Palestine. Uh, and it quickly became apparent to me uh, what an unbridgeable gulf there is uh, between the at best reformist efforts by what is considered uh, by many the Israeli left uh, and the clear demands for dismantling the structures of apartheid uh, by Palestinians. Uh, and in doing this work, I'm always learning from and guided by um, the Palestinian Boycott National Committee and PACB. Um, to me, the BNC's principled and strategic leadership is incredibly inspiring. Um, it has given me uh, a clear roadmap as an Israeli citizen, as a settler, uh, for how to act ethically uh, and how to challenge the colonial violence and military occupation that are in fact reproducing my society as a settler society. Uh, and so I hope that MESA members can understand how crucial it is that the BDS movement is offering Israelis this roadmap to a future of decolonization um, and true equality and justice. Thank you all for those um, very moving, very honest, uh, and very clear um, interventions that help situate us not merely as you know talking heads, but as as people who are living in this world, who are implicated, who are implicated uh, through complicity and resistance. Um, and thank you to Shireen for starting us off by grounding us in the reminder that Palestine is a gift and that we are struggling towards uh, for liberation from also places of, uh, of this, of love and of, of accepting this gift and, and, and 
how we can make more of it. So with that now, I'd like to pivot to our question, our Q&A part. I've already posed the question to you, Shireen. For the audience that's just joining us, I'll sum it up and say that the question that I posed uh, to Shireen was about telling us as someone who is a leader in um, Palestine, Palestinian studies, right? One of the um, arguments that we often hear is that BDS threatens the academic freedom of Israeli academics in a way that, you know, outrightly obfuscates just how much Palestinian academic freedom is infringed on a structural level every day. And as a Palestinian historian, um, Shireen is, uh, contends with that historically and currently. And so uh, if, you can, if you can help illuminate that for us um, and the audience. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'll say, first of all, that I want to speak to, I mean, I'm so inspired by everyone on this panel um, and really honored to be with you all. And I think that we can take a cue from Maya in thinking about, um, about this question in particular, um, which is what, what about Israeli scholars when we do this boycott divestment sanctions, if we pass this resolution at MESA. And I think um, Maya is leading us to be really thinking about the fact that and centering that Palestinian freedom is actually central <laughs> uh, to Israeli freedom and that Israelis can and only will be free when Palestinians are free. And so I just want to conceptually put that point forward. Secondly, I would say in terms of the BDS resolution at MESA, um, um, and here I just want to speak as a committed activist and organizer, those of us who are working on this um, um, resolution on the back end have every plan um, if we are successful after March 22nd to begin a solidarity fund that will um, uh, mitigate the, the costs of um, the inevitable um, the inevitable frivolous lawsuits that we will be subject to, but also to care for and 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 um, support uh, scholars. Palestinian scholars and Israeli scholars who will not be able to travel due to Israeli restrictions on anybody uh, uh, affiliating uh, with uh, BDS, right? So if your university is not going to reimburse you, um, we're going to try to find a way to support people in a spirit of mutual aid um, and in that very spirit of thinking of our freedoms as inextricably linked. Having said that, I will also point out that the concern um, uh, uh, and, and angst around what will happen to Israeli scholars is itself an indication of the blindness around the very condition of Palestinian scholars. So my question there is always, well, why aren't you worried about the Palestinians who are in effective exile as we speak? right, who are subject to such intense and recurring and escalating violations of basic academic freedom, of basic rights to movement that make education impossible, right, that, that, that render it at every turn uh, 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 compromised. And so here, I want to just direct people to the good work of the Committee on Academic Freedom um, of MESA, and I'm just going to read to you the last titles of the last few months um, to give you a sense of what is it that Palestinian academics are facing. And you can all find this. It's an archive of sorts, right? Um, in February, um, the Committee on Academic Freedom uh, uh, protested um, the Israeli army's invasion of Birzeit University and its assault on students. In December, we protested uh, the latest attack on Palestinian universities and civil society or organizations, the criminalization of 
higher education, as well as basic civil society. Um, the arrest and detention of Palestinian students. Um, in, in July, 45 Palestinian university students. Um, in, in June, the killing of two uh, Palestinian students by the Israeli army. In April, the ongoing arrest and detention of students uh, in Palestinian universities. The record goes on and on and on. And here I will also direct you to the latest uh, uh, technology of denying Palestinians the ac access to higher education, right? Which is, and here I'm quoting from the Birzeit University statement, which rejects Israel's uh, re most recent attempt to constrict that fundamental right. Um, and the freedom and autonomy of Palestinian universities. This is a directive set scheduled to take effect in May 2022, and it is titled the procedure for entry, quote, this is in quotes, the procedure for entry and residence of foreigners in Judea and Samaria region, end of quote. That directive grants Israelis uh, Israel, the Israeli military immense powers to isolate Palestinian universities from the outside world, to determine the future of the, of the course of Palestinian um, higher education. Um, it gives Israeli military the absolute right to select which international faculty, academic researchers, and students may be present at Palestinian universities. It also allows them to impose their own arbitrary arbitrary criteria on which fields of study are permissible and what qualifications are acceptable, right? So the record is long and we only have an hour today, <laughs> but a basic Google search will allow you to see that the constriction of Palestinian academic freedom is a central core of the struggle. And it is that academic freedom that we are standing on behalf of. The, the final point I'll make here, uh, you know, and, and, and sometimes this um, comes up uh, uh, in discussions around BDS, like people will say, well, well, will I still be able to go to Israeli archives if I, if, if I sign BDS? Yes, you will be able to do you know, if Mesa passes this resolution, it is you will continue as an individual member, be able to go wherever you want. But what I want to invite people to think about here is to see the archive itself as a colonial site and space. In fact, there has not been any attack on Palestinian on Palestine or the Palestinians that has not targeted specifically archives and documents as part of its attack. And this is why you find the confiscated records of, Pal of Palestinians in multiple Israeli sites, right? And the irony here is that all of those multiple sites are available to people only to people who can access them. Right. So these are there are multiple stories and organizations working on the 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 centrality of settler colonialism as a struggle that is about precisely the archive. When you enter the archive, you are entering, you are in effect complicit with that power. Right. And so here I think that people need to remember that the struggle for sovereignty and freedom is about not just the land, but also about the capacity to produce, distribute, and circulate knowledge, and to be able to have that freedom of mobility and, 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 and uh, uh, access that is presently denied to Palestinians in the West Bank, in Gaza, and in East Jerusalem. I can also go on at length, but I won't because I've already taken up too much space, about what it means to be a Palestinian scholar of Palestine in the United States and the multiple ways that we must guard, protect, and understand ourselves as already guilty before we even open our mouths, right? This is the kind of worldview that we must constantly reside. So. 
when people say, oh, well, what, what's the BDS resolution going to do if people pass it in Mesa? It's simply symbolic. You know what? Yes, it is largely symbolic. But what is the symbol? The symbol is a shift of the cultural scene. The symbol is a support of what is utterable, what is acceptable, and who deserves those basic fundamental rights. Thank you for those reminders, Shireen, and um, a thorough breakdown also of Mesa's longstanding commitment that this is not for that the, this work is, is in line with that, um, and also highlighting how recent it is that even scholars at Bidizid University are are also refracted and subject to uh, security oversight and concern. Um, so, which brings us back to you know Charles's point, telling us about being a subject of surveillance, being securitized. So Charles, I turn to you now. Many have suggested that it's only through honest and open dialogue that a fair and workable resolution of, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict will be achieved and that BDS hinders this goal in so much as it imposes new barriers to academic exchange and conversation. Could you speak a little about why you do not find this argument persuasive, why you embrace BDS as opposed to more other dialogic approaches to the conflict? Sure. Um, so on one hand, it seems to me that there's nothing you know, like a dialogue taking place today. That is at least not one that has any clear potential to slow the momentum of the occupation. Um, for most Israelis, the Palestinians have become a non-issue, an irritant that can be largely ignored. Um, this is particularly true in the last 10 years, right? That it's um, any will to engage in meaningful dialogue evaporated some time ago, except perhaps among a very tiny and increasingly marginalized fringe of activists and academics whose efforts hold no future in the Israel of today. And that seems very clear. Um, in my view, on the other hand, you know, the potentiality of so-called dialogue, which let's say is a practice that I would um, in principle support and see to be of great value. But my view of it in this, in the thinking in the Israeli-Palestinian context has been very much shaped by my age, that is by the perspective afforded by 40 years of observing what's been the continuous expansion of Israel and the continuous disappearance of Palestine, or at least the, the continuous movement of Palestinian lands into Israeli control. Um, and so from that perspective, like it's been suggested that the two populations have been, you know, for years stuck at an impasse. And that's often the kind of framework we're invited through which to see this um, the situation in Israel and Palestine, um, that people are divided by right issues that they simply are incapable of resolving, and these continue to hold them in a kind of stalemate. But you know, having looked at, having observed this part of the world for many, many years, then it doesn't seem that doesn't seem to be true at all to me. That is, while we can think of sort of moments of dialogue and moments of stalemate that have taken place over over many decades. And these can be seen as steps like forward toward a kind of eventual accord or obstacles put in place of it. Um, when viewed together, you know, all of this has contributed to one unmistakable and unwavering progress in a certain direction. And that is the continuous transfer of land from one, from one group to another. Like that process has been unaffected, it seems, right? That is, you know, we may disagree about how to characterize that progress. There'll be disagreements about how, what people consider its legality or the ethical claims marshaled in its defense, um, the morality of its methods. But the process itself, you know, is not something around which there's a question. Um, that is the movement of land from one group and into the hands and under the control of another. This process of um, has continued over the course of many decades, undeterred by stalemates or shifting political currents, under labor as much as Likud, under Arafat as much as Mahmoud Abbas, in moments of you know, optimism around dialogue and in moments of pessimism around stalemate and 
and military actions. So where all of these events or negotiations of a given moment, they may appear indeterminate, that some may, may invite a kind of optimism and others not, you add them up over the years, the legal, the illegal, the gentle, the brutal, the justified, the unjustified, however, all, taking light of all the different ways they may be characterized. And the result is a one, is a one dimensional history of territorial expansion. Right? So in that sense, that fact seems to be undeterred by you know, the moments of the different forms of dialogue that have, that have taken place across this terrain. So seen in this context of claims and counterclaims, violence and counterviolence, let's say the announcement of something like the, the expelling of Palestinians from Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem, it falls off the radar. It becomes simply one more gesture in this paralyzed world of Israeli-Palestinian political theater. But if you wrote, relocate this announcement, let's say the expulsion of, of families from Sheikh Jarrah, Against the, backdrop, against the backdrop of the smooth and ceaseless process of land expropriation that has taken place over decades, and all ambiguity and paralysis dissolves. It seems very clearly right, that this is simply one moment in a continuous and, and uninterrupted process. Um, when political analysts in the region have insisted on the importance of stepping back from the tit for tat, of daily events in order to bring into discussion this broader, more historical view. And defenders of, of Israeli expansionist policies have usually responded in two ways. First, they've argued that the Palestinians themselves, by their refusal to accept the existence of Israel and give up violence, are to blame for whatever dispossession of land they have suffered. By sabotaging each opportunity for peace put on the table by Israel, they argue Palestinians bear the responsibility for their ever shrinking homeland. The claim that the victims of territorial expropriation deserve their plight due to their own treachery and aggression has a long historical pedigree, right? And, and particularly in relation to the United States. The dispossession of Native American lands by white colonists, for example, was justified on many occasions as the unavoidable consequence of the natives refusal to remain within the generous territorial divisions allotted them and by their continual recourse to violence and acts of terror against peaceful colonists. Today, from our vantage point, such claims appear only as window dressing for brazen territorial conquest. And it's hard to think of any example where, with the, with the hindsight of historical distance, we would not be led to a similar conclusion. In short, while I'm a strong believer in the value of dialogue and conversation, um, it's clear to me that the moments of dialogue that have occurred over the decades between Israelis and Palestinians have been completely incapable of slowing the tide of Israeli expansion. And that despite the optimism such efforts may have produced for short moments and the goodwill or not of the interlocutors, these efforts have served primarily as a screen for the ongoing removal of Palestinians from their land. And this is not necessarily to impugn the interlocutors in any way. It's simply to say within the broad view that I think it's important to take here, the view afforded by many decades, um, then it, these individual moments of, of dialogic possibility, right? Acquire a different, one sees them in a different light. Um, not just as simply lost opportunities, but actually as part of the, the construction of the process of occupation and expropriation. So in light of this historical lesson, I cannot see a vote against BDS as anything but an endorsement of the status quo today, and thus a denial of Palestinian rights and a dismissal of the equal value of Palestinian lives. And that's, that's the, the viewpoint that you know, I feel, um, you know, has uh, over the last 40 years of observing events taking place there that's inescapable, at least as I see it. So thank you for the question. Thank you, Charles. That was really very clear and also places for us um, dialogue and context and, and what it would mean now. So Kamran, now I turn to you. 
As a leading scholar of the humanities, can you address the concerns that BDS is anti-Semitic? How do you think this accusation has been deployed? And what work is it doing? It would be interesting to hear you comment on the role of boycott responding to Russia's um, now war on Ukraine, as well as how it's distinct for a demand to end crippling sanctions regimes on the like the ones on Iran. Thank you. Um, uh, so uh, it's a big question. It's a really daunting one. I mean, the first question in particular, the the you know, I say that because I think that for any of us who are engaged in BDS uh, work, really one of the most painful accusations to face is the charge of anti-Semitism. It's one that really, um, I think, uh, provokes us because um, I think it's uh, clear that for anyone who's thoughtfully engaged with BDS, um, uh, we, we have to politically and ethically begin with the recognition of the scope of horrors, atrocities, and the pain that flow from the ideology of anti-Semitism in relation to the history of Zionism as well. Um, and so as students of history, we take seriously a, an understanding of the origins of Zionism uh, within the history of anti-Semitism. Um, and we applied the, the many lessons that are learned from uh, histories of Jewish suffering, um, in particular as a result of anti-Semitism in Europe, but also elsewhere, um, to our analysis of the situation in Palestine. Uh, these are things that are illuminating. They're not. They're not in conflict. Um, and so we view anti-Semitism as being uh, so significant a phenomenon as to offer lessons that are uh, nearly universal in application, including in Palestine. Uh, even as we acknowledge certain specificities to the experiences of Jewish suffering, and uh, for example, the, the nature of the Shoah, which I think we do need to acknowledge the particularities of that. But nonetheless, those lessons offer paradigms for understanding aspects of what's happening in Palestine. And um, so to, to my mind, the charge of anti-Semitism where BDS is concerned obtains only where the very concept of anti-Semitism is defined in such a way as to be an instrument against activism, such as BDS's uh, activism that criticizes the state of Israel or the ideology of Zionism. But to my mind, there's, there, there's no logic for, for such a charge because it, it's an ahistorical rendering of anti-Semitism itself. Um, and it, it's founded on, the, it, it, on a stated equivalence between the state of Israel and the Jewish people, um, wherever they are, uh, and making a criticism of Israel an ipso facto attack on Jews. Uh, we know that that's, that that's, a, that, that's just a, a false paradigm. Um, I can add to that something that I think Shireen gestured to, which is a, a quality in this conversation and in the charge of anti-Semitism, which, uh, which makes it painful, um, uh, which is a kind of identitarian subtext that's not often spoken of, in which the racialization of Arab and Muslim scholars, and perhaps others as well, um, come, comes with it, uh, you know, brings with it a certain kind of uh, uh, conceptual uh, argument of a predisposition to anti-Semitism, like this is a racialized predisposition, right? And uh, and I think that um, so for those of us who come from Arab or Muslim backgrounds, uh, or however we identify ourselves, um, that kind of charge is even more is even more profound. And it's not so. Again, I, I you know I say that to say that it's not often acknowledged that there's there's a play in in the charge of anti-Semitism when directed towards Palestinians, when directed towards again others of particular identities um, that, uh, that is undermining because it works within the universe, a racialized universe that, uh, that, that presents those identities as predisposed to anti-Semitism. Um, and so that's why Apologists of Israel have successfully deployed this charge you know, in various cases. And we've seen the lives of people destroyed, their careers scuttled over such um, specious claims. Um, but I would argue also that a commitment to BDS is ethically twinned with a disposition of vigilance and proactive commitment to coalition building against anti-Semitism. Uh, it's something that we have to do. Um, uh, there's no doubt that anti-Semitism is an increasing phenomenon by various measures. Uh, we, we acknowledge that as well. The massacre of Jewish worshipers in Pittsburgh and the hostage taking in a synagogue in Texas, you know, both events varieties of, of this phenomenon. Um, the greater level of this 
danger it is presented from far right neo Nazi and white supremacist circles. I think every analysis would lead us to that conclusion, but it doesn't diminish that there are other elements that also are concerning, um, whether they come from um, a certain kind of political orientation coming out of the uh, uh, revivalist religious uh, discourse in Muslim societies, or even certain regressive trends within the left. I'd argue that, they, that, that we do have to be clear-eyed about some of those things, but I think that there's a balance here that we also have to recognize, which is that the threat is coming, broadly speaking, from a particular quarter. But I think that, again, BDS, you know, these, uh, these phenomena, even if, even if we find elements of you know, traces of anti-Semitism or even prevalent trends of anti-Semitism within um, a variety of circles, they should not be mobilized for the defense of the indefensible, which is the defense of an apartheid system in Israel-Palestine. I mean, I just don't see how that, that flows from, from one to the other. Um, so BDS is not an end in and of itself. It's a process of education. It's a process of engagement. And part of this education is a commitment to anti-Semitism, as much as it is uh, a process of education around the realities that flow from the policies of the state of Israel. Um, if I might, I'll, I'll end with a quote from Edward Said um, from a, uh, an essay he wrote in 2000, so a couple of years before his passing, um, and uh, which I think addresses these questions in an in a interesting way, in a useful way. He says, most Palestinians are indifferent to and often angered by stories of Jewish suffering, since it seems to them as sub, uh, that as subjects of Israeli military power, Anti-Semitism seems remote and irrelevant while their land is taken and their homes are being bulldozed. Conversely, most Israelis refuse to concede that Israel is built on the ruins of Palestinian society, and that for them the catastrophe of 1948 continues until the present. Yet there can be no possible reconciliation, no possible solution, unless these two communities confront each, each, each's experience in the light of the other. It seems to me essential that there can be no hope of peace unless the stronger community the Israeli Jews acknowledges the most powerful memory for Palestinians, namely the dispossession of an entire people. And as the weaker party, Palestinians must also face the fact that Israeli Jews see themselves as survivors of the Holocaust, even though that tragedy cannot be allowed to justify Palestinian dispossession. So I think it's, it's helpful here that Said acknowledges that there are different perceptions at play, but that they're framed within a power discourse, or within a, within a paradigm of power that, um, that helps us to understand that, uh, you know, uh, what seems to be possibly at times, uh, you know, not a, a, a prioritization of anti-Semitism at every moment by a Palestinian or by a critic of the state of Israel is not necessarily the end of the story, right? that this is framed within a political and historical reality in which uh, different parties are positioned differently. Um, so, and uh, if I can, I'm from that to sort of segue to the other comments. I mean, I think that, uh, the, you know, the examples of, of the Ukraine, uh, uh, the current sort of boycott movements that are that are rising very quickly around Ukraine. Um, you know, I, I know that it's uh, I, I see the disappointment and the frustration um, that many of us, uh, many Palestinians in particular, feel around the fact that uh, in the case of the Ukraine, these movements these have arisen and are being championed and celebrated um, as ethical uh, and so on, but they're absolutely equivalent to you know something like BDS or other movements that Palestinians have long championed. Um, and uh, but I think that this is an opportunity. I think we should think of it as an opportunity. I think that rather than than um, you know raising the understandable frustration first, we should see this as a moment to, to link these these uh, these kinds of decisions to sort of remind those people who have just understood that boycott matters as a as, as an ethical position against the an occupation, uh, as we're seeing, you know, as carried out by Russia and, and Ukraine, that it that that this is that this uh, that this is a lesson for us to understand how to also think about Israel and Palestine, and it and it absolutely legitimizes, in my view, um, uh, the politics of BDS. All right, I think I've spoken too long. Thank you, Kamran. That um, <laughs> I wrote you separately. I think that that was a master class. Thank you for highlighting for us the historic um, inaccuracies. Thank you also for lifting up uh, 
Shireen's point that she was gesturing about what it means, like what is the fertile ground when you accuse Palestinians of being anti-Semitic and what is being suggested there, what possibilities are there for Palestinians um, in even, you know, being, and then coming back now to ac actually answer all questions directly. So thank you again for that. Maya, last but not least, you have been doing um, incredible research on, on the imbrication of the Israeli Academy in particular in racial violence and ongoing, you know, uh, colonial takings and settler colonial expansion. Oftentimes, the response to academic boycott is that academic boycott should be left off the table, you know, target, target a, a consumer product, but not the academics, um, because it has nothing to do with the state. And yet your research, as well as the research of others has demonstrated the exact opposite. Can you can you walk us through some of that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think this is one of the greatest myths, in fact, that Israeli universities and their advocates promote to counter the Palestinian call for the academic boycott. Uh, but as you said, uh, Nuka, there's an incredible amount of evidence um, amassed by Palestinian scholars and activists, uh, as well as by Israeli and international scholars about the complicity of Israeli universities in Israeli colonialism and military occupation. And I think it is so important to really attend to how expansive and how deep the complicity of Israeli universities in Israeli state violence truly is. Um, and this starts from the campuses themselves, right? So Israeli universities serve as crucial infrastructure to Israeli colonization of Palestinian lands. Um, their campuses were built as strategic outposts to aid in the removal of Palestinian communities, expand Israeli settlements, um, and advance what Israel calls uh, the Judaization, right, of historic Palestine. So this is true uh, of 48 and, and, and of occupied territory. So um, this is you know, perhaps best known in the context of Israel's latest uh, recognized university, Ariel University, um, which was explicitly established um, and openly so to grow and to legitimize uh, the illegal settlement of Ariel in the occupied West Bank. But that is equally true of Israel's first university, Hebrew University, um, that served as a strategic territorial enclave between 1948 and 67, um, whose Mount Scopus campus was built on Palestinian lands in East Jerusalem um, and continues to encroach uh, on Isawiya and other uh, neighboring Palestinian communities today. Um, likewise, University of Haifa um, is instrumental in Judaizing the Galilee, Ben Gurion University, a central force uh, in the Judaization of the Nakab. So this is really true across uh, campuses. And so just, you know, just as a starting point to understand uh, this imbrication. Um, but then we also find extensive epistemological complicity across departments and disciplines. Um, for the context of the Mesa conversation, it might particularly be worth noting that the field of Middle East studies uh, in Israeli universities continues to be deeply embedded uh, in the Israeli security state. Um, so one of the countless examples of this, uh, and I really could give many, uh, is the Middle East studies department at Hebrew University. Um, which in 2019 won the Ministry of Defense tender to house and to run Chavat Salot, which is an educational program for uh, the Israeli intelligence corps. And so housing this program has not only uh, flooded the department's classrooms with soldiers, it has also brought the military into the department to supervise the content um, for these student soldiers. Um, this is forcing Palestinian students to study with soldiers training to surveil and spy on them, their families, their communities, um, studying the Middle East for explicitly military and colonial ends. Um, and this has also entailed the creation of a sort of uh, special base-like dorm for the soldiers overseen by uh, Israeli military security, further militarizing the already overtly militarized uh, campus at Mount Scopus. So that is, again, just one of, of many examples, um, because there are so many tailored academic programs to train Israeli soldiers, security forces, uh, including the police, including the Shin Bet, uh, that are run by uh, Israeli universities. And really not one Israeli university doesn't have multiple such programs, uh, some more overt and some and, and, and open and some more covert. Um, research institutes, departments, faculty uh, regularly conduct research for the Israeli military, for Israeli uh, weapons corporations, both private and state owned, um, to develop technologies for both use in Palestine and for international export. Uh, and the universities themselves um, institute as institutions solicit and grant funding for the development of military technologies uh, field tested in occupied Palestine. And so really I could give so many examples, but given this level of complicity, uh, I think it is absolutely clear that true academic freedom can only be achieved uh, through the decolonization advanced by the academic boycott movement. 
Thank you, Maya. So what we um, get from these initial interventions is right the right rightful centering of Palestinians and not only their unfreedom, but their lack of academic freedom. Um, how Israeli universities are absolutely complicit and not just a tangential uh, concept, but play a direct role um, both in this lack of academic freedom and in unfreedom generally, um, the idea that other approaches that have been tried um, are actually inappropriate and, and, and um, is too a, a dynamic of power that can sustain, um, can sustain these conditions and sustain the status quo, as Charles reminded us. And again, back to Kamran's point about how different accusations have been weaponized in order to, to push us into that corner of being continuing to be part of the problem. So thank you to all of you. I want to, in our last few minutes, to see if there are any questions from the our Facebook audience. This is also being recorded. It will be provided as a resource, but now if anybody has any questions, let's see. There are no questions yet. So I imagine that this means that folks agree that this BDS resolution should pass enthusiastically. Um, I wanna personally plug um, that I've renewed my MESA membership, that I have voted in the affirmative, that I really do hope um, that MESA passes this resolution. Um, it is, I think, would, would strengthen the association and be reflective of how it's grown um, across time and it's actually keeping up with the time uh, to do so. So um, if, if in these few minutes, if anybody would like to add anything interesting about their conversations that they're having, concerns, or one last plug. Vote for the resolution. Vote for the resolution today, tomorrow, as soon as you can vote for the resolution. It is the only ethical thing to do at this moment in time. Be part of history, be on the right side of history. Vote for the resolution. That's right. Be on the right side of the history as told to us by the historian. Um, also, <laughs> there is a Mesa ballot. It's on the Mesa website. Um, we will post that link on the Facebook page where this is being broadcast for, e for um, easier access. All right. So with that, we've got six more days. Please do vote. Please help Mesa stay true to itself, honor its legacy, build these pathways um, to decolonial futures in line with the academics who are both experts and students and agents of social change um, and also agents of harm when we are complicit. So with that, thank you again, uh, Professor Shirin Sayeli, Professor Charles Hershkin, Professor Kamran Rastagar, to our scholar Maya Wind, um, and to all of you for joining us, especially to the Jadaliya team. Shout out to Arij and Molly May, who have handled the tech on this broadcast. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, Nura. Nura. <laughs> thank you, Nura. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.